can you hear me? Yep, okay. Um, okay, so my name is Tal, I'm a student of Leon. Um, and today we'll talk about uh, neuroimaging statistics. Um, I think that a big portion portions would be uh, relevant for anyone who does uh, neuroscience. Um, we we'll start, the first half would be um, a general review, introduction to statistical inference. Uh, we'll give particular attention to non-parametric or sampling-based approaches. Uh, then we'll uh, have a break um, and talk about fMRI and the multiple comparisons problem, which is the main statistical issue in uh, neuroimaging. Okay. So this is a crude uh, taxonomy of statistical tests. Uh, it's nothing formal. It's just, it's just my way to organize uh, the tests to myself. So we have the parametric tests and non-parametric tests. Uh, and as we will see, there are different flavors of non-parametric tests. Um, and we'll uh, visit uh, each of these uh, uh, domains. So. We're going to use the most, uh, the silliest example you've seen uh, in statistics class. So we have uh, alien invaders, and they um, snatch uh, people uh, out of their beds, uh, and they're interested in, in uh, one important question, um, do human males and females have different heights? Um, and the reason um, I, I use the um, image of uh, aliens is that they know nothing about the actual population of human beings. What the, uh, every, the only thing they have is the sample, the people that they uh, abduct using the uh, tractor beam. So this is the sample, and we have uh, seven female and uh, seven male. Now we measure their uh, height, height. We can now return them to the bed, wipe their memories. Uh, and these are the data points we have. And this is all the information we have on this problem. problem. And again, the question is whether um, the men in the population are higher on average uh, than the women. So one way to go, uh, which is the maybe the easiest one, is the parametric way. So we will assume that the heights in the population are normally distributed within each group. Um, and actually for height, this is uh, a correct assumption. And once we, we um, assume that, uh, we can use uh, a t-test. So uh, we have the difference uh, between the means divided by the standard error of the means, which means if we will repeat this experiment uh, infinite number of times, what will be the standard deviation of this distribution, the distribution of the difference between the means? Please stop me if anything is, is unclear. Uh, I think that we have time. So this is the standard error of the difference of the means. Um, and in t it is, it is uh, made of uh, a pool standard deviation of the population, and this uh, factor, uh, which um, should be, sorry, uh, square root of that, um, uh, which um, inflates the t as the sample increases. So if we will have uh, 70 uh, um, participants in our experiments, um, the t, t value will be uh, square root of uh, 70 larger. Um, so, uh, given the, uh, given the assumptions, um, the t statistic is distributed under the null, which means under the assumption that there's no difference between um, male and females um, in a particular uh, analytically defined distribution, um, and we uh, look at the observed t-value, and this integral is the p-value, 
which means the probability of observing a test statistic as extreme as uh, the one we are observing given the null hypothesis. Again, given the assumption that there's no difference in the population. Um, and generally, this is uh, a, a case of null hypothesis significant testing. Um, most of the other uh, methods we'll see are also uh, case of, uh, cases of that. And let's look at the assumptions we make. So uh, the null hypothesis, which we want to test, is no difference between the means. These are the expectancies of the height in the uh, male and female uh, population. Uh, and we have auxiliary assumptions, um, interval level of measurement, um, measurement, which means that um, the difference between two and one is like the difference uh, between six and five. Uh, a second assumption, uh, assumption is that, that the samples are independent of each other. Uh, for example, if we'll um, snatch pairs of uh, uh, husbands and wives, we'll have to use a slightly different t-test. Um, and within each group, the dependent variables follow a normal distribution. Um, and if we have large enough sample, this can be relaxed. <coughs> relaxed. Um, so even if you have something which is not normally distributed, like uh, weight, which is log normal, uh, if you average over uh, many su subjects, your uh, sampling distribution would be normal. So you can still use the t-test. Um, but th th there are um, also other motivations uh, to use non parametric uh, statistics, we'll, which we'll see later on. So, um, again, so uh, this means that uh, you can, the interval between um, two and one is the same quantity like the interval between five and four. Uh, this won't be correct for, for example, behavioral ratings that you have to uh, give a score between one to five. This is not a linear scale. Um, so this is a required assumption. So rank statistics. Um, these are the non-parametric statistics that you usually find if you Google um, non-parametric statistics. So the idea here is that um, instead of looking at the means, we rank, we sort the samples. So this is the um, shortest sample and this is the highest sample, um, we can forget about the means and we can actually forget about the actual height because now we'll use only the ranks. So we can ask uh, which group has um, higher sum of ranks and if it's large enough um, we can uh, say that it's uh, significant. So this is uh, the U statistics um, the test is called the Mann-Whitney test. Uh, so this is the sum of ranks of group one, sum of ranks of, of group two. We have these uh, normalizing terms which uh, can account for differently sized groups. Um, since this is a two-tailed <laughs> test, we, we are interested in uh, differences either uh, in one direction or the other. Uh, we take the maximal uh, of these two. And there's actually um, an easier explanation of the U statistic. Um, let's assume that we take all the possible pairs of men and women. Okay? And now, for each pair, we uh, test whether the, the man is higher than, than the woman. Uh, so we mark uh, the higher man in green. So the U is actually the number of wins uh, in this matrix. So it's, it's a very natural uh, way to look at the data um, and you make much less assumptions. So the null hypothesis is that the probability of observing um, a greater uh, observation of one group uh, compared with uh, an observation of another group is the same like uh, the opposite. So the probability of observing, uh, if you pick a man and a woman 
uh, in random, the probability of uh, having a higher man um, is the same as the probability of having uh, a higher woman. And the auxiliary assumptions uh, are ordinal level of measurement, which means that we have some uh, sort of um, sense of order of um, that two is greater than one and three is greater than two, and so on. Uh, they don't need to be, uh, they don't need to have um, uh, equally uh, sized intervals between the, the units. Uh, we still have the assumption, assumption of uh, independence. Um, and we can now um, forget about the assumption of a, a normal distribution. And uh, just, um, I forgot to mention, um, the auxiliary, auxiliary assumptions have to hold. If they don't hold, the statistical test is invalid. We, we can't learn nothing. Uh, the only thing that we test whether it holds or not is the null hypothesis. Okay, so th they have a different status. Okay, so uh, for almost but not all uh, parametric tests, there are um, non-parametric uh, equivalents. So we've seen the man whitney u, which is equivalent to the two-sample two t-test. Uh, for a pair t-test, we have uh, a similar test. We, we can also have a non-parametric uh, rank-based ANOVA, repeated measures of ANOVA. Uh, and I guess that you all know um, uh, the difference between uh, Pearson's R and Spearman's uh, rho. Yes. So does it mean equivalent to it, it, uh, it is meant for the same use case. That, for example, the, the two-sample t-test and the man with u deals with the, the comparison of two independent samples. But they're giving, like, their strengths is similar? They're giving no. So you have less assumptions here. And as we will see, you pay with power. They're less sensitive. Hmm? Ah, so... Everybody knows about uh, Pearson, right? Pearson correlation. So uh, if you rank your um, observations before you compute Pearson, this is the Spearman rule. Um, and this tests for any, any monotonous uh, relationship. So you might have um, so if your data points. have this shape, this would be um, a Spearman row of one, whereas the um, Pearson would be smaller because it doesn't uh, follow a straight line. Um, any more questions? So it seems that um, the non-parametric non tests are um, Better than the parametric ones, but um, you you have you need to pay, and you pay in power. So, for example, this is the ex uh, the same um, data from before. So, for the t-test, uh, we have this p-value, uh, and for the man Whitney, uh, we have a much a larger p-value, which means less significant. And if we will um, increase the height of the man. Um, the p-value will uh, increase, the p-value associated with the p-value will uh, decrease. Uh, the same happens here, uh, to, but, but not so dr dramatically. And now we see that the uh, man with the U is saturated. So once these two groups are perfectly separated, U equals 49, which means that all the possible pairs, uh, in all the possible pairs, the men win. Um, so, for a greater effect, we still have the same significance. Okay, so we have sort of a, a ceiling to our significance. Uh, and this is a, a price that we pay. Um, another issue is that sometimes the magnitude of the um, observations is, is very informative. So, let's say that we uh, test the correlation, and we have a cloud of points around zero, no correlation, and there's this beam 
of highly correlated points. So um, Pearson's R would see this uh, correlation, whereas uh, the Spearman's uh, correlation uh, won't see it because it will give the same um, weight to these differences and these differences. So I think it's, it's nice to have, especially in behavioral and medical experiments where you have uh, only a couple of outcomes, but uh, usually for neuroimaging we need to have something which is more powerful and more flexible, uh, and that would be usually the random permutation test. Can I? Just you said that the non-parametric is better, but we take the power, so why is it better? It's a trade-off. So, first of all, if your parametric assumptions um, hold, for example, in the case of heights, use the parametric test because it will have the maximum power. But usually we don't know uh, that our uh, assumptions hold. Uh, it might be because uh, our sample is too small, and it might be because we measure something which is not uh, an average, something which is more complex. For example, the accuracy of the classifier, um, any kind of uh, outcome uh, which is uh, not, not so nicely behaved as means, and even median, for example. For the median, we have no parametric, parametric solution. We'll have to use no parametric solution if we, if we would like to use median. So, so now we'll move to, the, to this. I will. Okay. okay. So uh, back to the alien experiment. So the idea now is to simulate the null um, distribution, which means the distribution of our test statistic, given the assumption that there's no effect, uh, by shuffling the labels of our two groups. So we can randomly assign our samples to um, men and women and compute again the t statistics. Okay, so we do many, many simulations. Um, so for this simulation, we have uh, t value and so on. Uh, and when we look across all the simulations, we actually get uh, an empirical null distribution of our um, uh, statistic. So this is the this is t value, uh, and we s the peak of this distribution is zero because we permitted the, the men and women. And we now look at the observed t value, the actual t value from the unshuffled original data, and it's somewhere he somewhere about here. Um, and the integral to its right is the p-value. And more precisely, uh, we count the number of simulations in which we have um, equal or larger uh, p-value than the observed, this is b, and m is the total number of simulations, and this will give you the p-value. Uh, if you want to use the plus one, ba bad things will happen, uh, they write about it. Um, you can get, uh, for example, um, zero valued p values, which means that your uh, observation is impossible under the null, uh, which usually you, ca you can't say that um, using uh, a finite sample. So you need to have this uh, formulation to have an, uh, a valid p value. Um, and those. Sorry. Yeah. This one? So, uh, yeah, so you mean you do the random computation and uh, use the uh, t hat to calculate In this case. Yeah. But yeah. this is a, fl a flexible uh, method. So instead of t-test, I could compute the difference between the two me uh, medians. Compute the median of the men, median of the women, oh, so and the difference. So, so this t uh, represents the, uh, the difference. The difference, two yes. Mean. But you can use a different statistic. You are not uh, limited to t, to t statistic. 
So, right, so it's allowed to do it. You will have a valid p-value, um, but you won't have a significant result according to the convention of uh, 05 if you won't have enough permutations. Uh, actually, for a low number of permutations, you can uh, enumerate, go over all the uh, permutations. You don't need to use random sampling. Uh, so that would be exact uh, permutation test. Yes, uh, I, I'm just adding another. That if you have a, sm a really small sample, the test is valid, uh, but it, it won't show you a significant effect. If you have a larger uh, sample, you can uh, go over all the permutations uh, um, and, and have without using this Monte Carlo sampling. Uh, and if you have many samples, you need to use the random sampling. Um, uh, here it, it works, right? If you have a, a single comparison, if you don't have to correct for multiple comparisons, it, we will see later. Uh, this is an easy example because height is maybe the, um, one of the largest effects in nature, the difference in height. In, in human physiology, so uh, it's easy to see these differences. Any more questions about this? Okay, so we don't have auxiliary assumptions. We have only the null hypothesis, which is called exchangeability. So it says that the observations in the two groups are exchangeable um, in terms of their labels. Um, another way to that would be that we assume statistical independence between the label and the outcome. Um, but sometimes um, we have difficulties with formulating this null hypothesis. Um, in many cases, the this exchangeability hypothesis uh, doesn't hold even under the null. Um, for example, if we have, let's assume that our observations are responses of a subject. So in some trials he says, he says yes, and in some trials he says no. Um, and so, so we might produce some kind of temporal structure. Um, and now by shuffling the labels, we also assume implicitly that there's no temporal structure. So now we, we uh, test something which is stronger than what we wanted to test, which is the difference between the trials with a yes and the trials with a no. Um, another example is uh, permuting time points in uh, fMRI. Someone might say, okay, I want to shuffle the time points and see whether the effect survive, uh, survives. But this would mean that you assume that there's no autocorrelation, uh, no smoothness to the fMRI data over time, which is, of course, uh, incorrect. Uh, so there are many ways of uh, forming invalid permutation tests. Uh, and there are some cases in which uh, we don't know how to um, formulate an exchangeability um, here, exchangeability uh, hypothesis. For example, the interaction effects in, uh, in factorial designs, ANOVAs. Uh, the couple of um, approach, permutation-based approaches to that, but it's not straightforward because there's no si simple shuffling that you can do that will. Um, eliminate the interaction and uh, leave the main effects intact. Okay. So, you are acquainted with um, two-way ANOVA. So in two-way ANOVA you have uh, two main effects and you might have an interaction effect. There's no way to shuffle the observations uh, in which the main effects will stay and the interaction will be uh, cancelled, permuted. Try and, and you will see that it's impossible. Why would you want to cancel This is your way to test it. I, if you had a way to shuffle your observations uh, in a way which uh, um, doesn't affect the main effects and, and but does cancel 
the interaction, that would be a good test for interaction, um, a non-parametric non -parametric one. But we can't do it using a simple permutation test. Because doing that, you assume that you also don't have main effects. So if you have a main effect, this will be significant, even if you don't have an interaction. Yeah, the question is whether you're testing whether you're only, if you only, if the question is whether uh, only the interaction is significant, then it's true that yes, the others um, mm -hmm. are But if you want to ask, You can test for the main effect, but you can't isolate the, the interaction. You can isolate the, the, the main effects, right? Because you can permute your observations uh, across the levels of one factor and the other one. But you don't have a way to, to test only the interaction using a simple shuffle. What people do is... I would say that you don't have a test for interaction because if you assume that you have that you don't have main effects, that's a very crude omnibus test. Um, it, it's not informative about the interaction. Um, I, I think that we move forward because it, it, it's a bit um, advanced. Um, okay, so. The main virtue of uh, random permutation tests is that you can use almost any test statistic, um, given that you can formulate the exchangeability in null hypothesis. Uh, so you can use, for example, a difference of median, uh, for which you don't have a parametric uh, way of uh, testing. Uh, you can also use parametric statistics, like the T, S, Pearson's R, uh, without caring about the normality. Um, and it might be a good idea because they might measure something which is um, uh, logical uh, to measure. Uh, rank statistics, and actually when you run in any statistical software um, a test like uh, Man Whitney we, that we've seen before, um, a permutation test is done under the hood. Um, and the more interesting examples are uh, complex statistics that use many channels and measure something uh, which is less straightforward in our data. So uh, one thing would be uh, the spatial extent, the size of fMRI blobs. Uh, if we have chance of activations, um, w we can um, measure whether the, they are uh, significantly large uh, versus chance. Um, question? Uh, um, how is this to test uh, on rank statistics um, to um, overcome the disadvantages? Of it, it, no, it doesn't. It just th this is a general approach which can be applied to any kind of statistic. If you use uh, this U statistic, you will be limited by the limit limitations of the U statistic. I'm just m making this distinction because uh, usually in um, uh, the specific uh, literature, people talk about these, okay? Uh, and actually, the um, special case, these, the uh, permutation based statistics, which is um, a, a more flexible class. So, why do I permutation like you do with the permutation? Sorry? So if you have a small sample, uh, I, 
sort of before, if you have a small sample, when you run a Man Whitney U test, it actually uh, it, it does uh, a permutation test in order to compute your p value. If you, if you have a very large sample, it uses, uses some parametric approximation. The, the point here is that you are allowed to, to plug into this test any kind of test statistic you, you would like. Um, any questions about, about this? Okay. Maybe a more general question about the different methods and how to interpret them. Because like in parameters tests and I understand that like, okay, if I have three values, it's something I can just and if this value means that uh, according to the assumption A B C, the probability of getting um, the results versus the null result is such and such. But mm -hmm. in the non proven parameter test I'm not like okay, I get a value that I know that it's uh, there is it's uh, Intuitively, there is a distinct separation, then the value will be lower. If there is less, it will be higher, or vice versa. But is there an actual thing I can say about the probability of the correct result according to ABC, like, like assumption? Or like how, how should I interpret it? Or should I just like consider, it, okay, that's the value, and like the norm is if the standard, like if this value is about this, then we consider it good, and if it's below, then that. Now, I think that generally, um, if we compare the, for example, the uh, random permutation to the t-test, both formulate a null distribution, and the p-value uh, is this uh, integral as, uh, as a tail of that null distribution. The difference is, is, is in the way you formulate these two distributions. In the t-test, you use a parametric uh, model, and in the random permutation, you use simulations. Uh, but the, the basic logic of, uh, of hypothesis testing and the meaning of p-value is the same. Uh, there are subtleties which are related to the way the null hypothesis is formulated. Um, as in the, the, the as in the question of the exchangeability, which we discussed before, you're not sat satisfying. Yes, and I feel like I don't know. I think there is like some hidden assumptions or hidden null hypothesis that's like very complicated that I don't see clear. It's like not clear to me. Like how, wh why? So if, if you do it by sampling, then again you need. It's just hard for you to imagine how you can say something about the probability without having any assumption on priors or prior probabilities of anything. Hold that, we'll we talk about prior, priors in five minutes. Um, until now, we didn't use priors in any, any of the tests. It's all likelihood. The probability of the data given um, the model, given a hypothesis. Any more questions? Okay, so um, the last part we'll visit is the uh, bootstrap, bootstrapping. Um, so this this is a technique which is uh, a bit um, newer than the more modern than the uh, random permutation. It has um, it, it looks similar to permutations, but it's very different in its logic. So now we say, okay, we have this sample. Um, let's assume that this sample is the population. Okay? So we we'll now um, put the sample here, and we can generate new samples by drawing uh, observations from our uh, sample. And the way we do it is uh, by sampling re uh, replacement, which means that we can have the same sample twice, okay? So in this case, um, we didn't take uh, this observation, we, we took this one once, uh, we didn't take this observation, we took this observation twice, and so on. Um, so we still have 
seven, uh, seven women and um, seven uh, men, but these are uh, new samples which we somehow synthesize by uh, sampling them from our sample. So once we did that, we can... Uh Wait, you keep the separate? Yeah, usually you do. You can think about mixing the permutation approach and the bootstrapping approach, so you also mix the groups, but this is some sort of hybrid test. But now it matters which observation you take what. Sorry? Right. Right. So we'll get to the bias. Um, there might be a bias. Uh, the idea here is that we would like to somehow repeat the experiment using new samples. Um, and since we don't have new samples, we'll generate them. Okay. Uh, th there's another flavor of bootstrap, which is the parametric bootstrap. So we can uh, estimate Gaussian distributions uh, for the sample and then just draw observations uh, from uh, Gaussian distributions um, and then do whatever we would like. Um, but right now we talk about the, the non-parametric uh, bootstrap, which means uh, resampling our subjects. Uh, so... How would you take this uh, Gaussian So, uh, so this is the original sample. You can estimate uh, its average you can estimate its standard deviation. Um, you correct the standard deviation by factor, and now you have the parameters for the uh, distribution of the height of uh, women in the population. Then, why should you assume that this can? It depends. It, it, in this case, you, uh, we know that uh, heights are normally distributed, so we can do this. Uh, but one of the, uh, as we will see, one of the virtual, uh, virtues of the bootstrap is that it uh, allows us to replace uh, this assumption, the non parametric bootstrap. Any more questions? Yes. Sorry, again? Randomly. Randomly. You just, in each simulation, you generate a list of random numbers between 1 and 14, and this is the way you pick your, your uh, subject. Uh, because then you have something which is the same as your original sample. And you want to somehow simulate the variability, the uh, measurement error you have um, when, when using such a uh, defined sample. So the bootstrap, uh, and it, it's good that the sense that is, is not um, an exact test, and for some cases uh, it might be wrong, and we, we'll see that. Uh, for some cases it works good, uh, and sometimes it's the only thing that you can do. So it, it, it feels like cheating, right? Because uh, you take your sample and then you generate new samples and you measure the sampling error from that. Uh, and this is why it is called bootstrap, because it is um, like pulling yourself uh, from the mud uh, by pulling your uh, boots. Uh, so, so it's not exact. A and when you use uh, bootstrapping, you have to consider whether uh, the conditions are right. Uh, we'll have a couple of thoughts about that. So why would you choose this? Um, so <coughs> In some cases, let me go over the figures and uh, I'll answer your question. So, uh, for each simulation, in this example, we take the mean, but we can also take the median, for example. Uh, and now we generate, uh, when we look across all the simulations, we have a, an empirical sampling distribution of our test statistic. And in the case of uh, a mean, it's, it's not very interesting unless you have a highly non-normal population. Uh, but for example, for medians, um, you don't have any other way of generating these uh, sampling distributions. 
which now can uh, be translated into confidence intervals. So we can take for this, uh, null dis um, not null distribution, the sampling distribution of women, we can take uh, the um, uh, two and a half percentile and 95.5 uh, percentile, and this range would be a confidence interval for the height of women. Um, and we can do that for any kind of statistic, and we can do that uh, when normality uh, doesn't hold. Um, for example, uh, trimmed means, in which you take the most extreme values and you throw them away as outliers. So now you want to estimate your sampling uh, viability or standard error. Um, there's no parametric way to do that. The boot stuff can do that. Um, and in So there's a measure called trimmed mean, a trimmed average, which means that you take your sample and let's say that you throw the 10% most extreme observations. And now you compute, you calculate the mean using only the remaining observa observation. yeah, observations. So now you want to say something about your um, uh, standard error of this measure. How valuable is it if you will repeat the experiment? And you don't have any uh, parametric way to do it because there's no closed form uh, description of that uh, viability. Uh, but using the bootstrap, you can, instead of uh, using the means, you can use a, whatever statistic you would like and generate its uh, sampling distribution. Okay, uh, so this is not a null distribution. This is different than the uh, random permutation test because now we didn't assume uh, that uh, the women and men have different heights. So if we would like to test a hypothesis uh, using bootstrap, we have to uh, introduce some modification. So before we do this bootstrap, we will adjust the data. So we'll take in our case, we'll take the two samples and uh, align the uh, means, just move the uh, men so they will have the same average as the women. And now the data um, uh, is consistent with the null hypothesis of no differences. And only, only then we run the bootstrap. Um, and the, sorry? We can, for example, uh, calculate a t-test, right? So for I in each simulation, you sample new seven men and new seven women. They're not truly new. They're resamples of the men and women you have and computed t -test. And the distribution of these uh, t statistics over uh, across the simulations um, is a null distribution which is quite similar to the null distribution that we've seen for the random permutation test. Like the same creature like this. But you introduce the variability, right? Because each time you have a new sample. Yeah, you have the variance, but the mean will be something that you Right. So you enforced the null hypothesis. The logic is okay, let's assume that the null hypothesis is correct and we need to change samples for that in bootstrapping by, sim uh, by shifting the means. Um, and now you resample. So you say, given that the hypothesis is correct, we'll still have some noise, right? Because we have finite samples. So the, the extent of the noise is the uh, width of this distribution. So you can um, calculate the p-value in the same fashion as the original? You, you look at the original t-value. Okay, let's assume that we calculate the t-value. Um, so you have the original t-value uh, with the unshifted group, and you can compare that to the bootstrap t-value under the null. You lost me. 
Um, let's assume that before running these simulations, we shifted the men, so they will have the same uh, mean. And now we resample. Um, since we resample, uh, the p values won't be zero, right? We'll have different means. Um, and by looking at the, this distribution, we can say how probable is it to actually see a particular t value uh, given the null assumption. Sorry? You have one distribution for the uh, t values under the null, which you use, you produce by simulation, and you have a single real uh, t value from your original sample. Yes, the, the, t the t statistic is a normalized difference. It, it's a bit hard to follow the logic of Spoutsa because it is, um, it is difficult and, and in many cases it fails. Um, for example, um, uh, if you have a very small sample, let's say that you have a sample of one observation, so bootstrapping one observation you will be left with one observation and your estimation of the standard, uh, standard error would be zero, right? Because it's all, always the same one. So this is a, an obvious case in which the bootstrap fails. Um, and this is true also for n equals two and so on. There's some critical n uh, which is needed for the bootstrap to work. Also depending on the test statistic and the distribution of your population. Um, for some statistics, the bootstrap is inherently biased. Uh, for example, if you will think about the variability of your um, distribution, uh, even maybe, no, I think it's a, it's a good example. So the viability, uh, the variance is a, is a biased uh, measure for bootstrap, and you have to somehow correct uh, for that bias if you want to use bootstrap. Uh, and actually, uh, the statisticians that have that devote their entire life to bootstrap and develop uh, more and more uh, sophisticated bootstrapping techniques in order to have uh, less biased, uh, more reliable uh, bootstrapping procedures. So if you use uh, the bootstrap, you have to read about it uh, much more than what you've heard right now. Okay. So I guess that you can, as far as I know, uh, you can simulate different scenarios using the bootstrap, and people actually use it for power calculations, right? You run an experiment, you have 10 subjects, a pilot experiment, and now you want to re uh, run your real experiment, so you can somehow simulate your, uh, the different sample sizes by bootstrapping. Since you don't have analytical model, you don't have the analytical tools for power calculations that you think about. Any more questions? Yes. That your sample is uh, very representative of the population. And th this is a very strong assumption, which is often wrong. And this is why um, I think that the, if, when you can use a random permutation test, for example, when comparing wi between two groups uh, or calculating a correlation uh, in which you can shuffle your two variables, use a random permutation. Don't use the bootstrap. The bootstrap is useful when random permutation uh, can't be done. Let's think about a simpler case. Um, uh, if the assumption about the um, 
that the sample represents the population holds, what's the issue with the variance? Um, let's think about a simpler case. Let's say that your statistic is the number of unique heights that you have in your sample, okay, which is seven uh, for each group in your original experiment. You will never be able to, to have an unbiased estimate using the standard bootstrap. Right, because in each bootstrap sample, you will have less than your true number of uh, heights, unique heights. Because, because of the resampling. So, so there are many statistics which are uh, affected uh, in a bad way by having uh, duplicated uh, observations. Sorry. So in that, in the sense of the variance, uh, the sample is not representative enough. But it was more representative before. Before what? Before the Because you said that adding non-unique height. Right. Right. Yeah. Think about that, that example of unique heights. Okay. So for the bootstrap examples, you will always have. Um, almost always, uh, you will have less than seven unique heights in each groups of sample, right? So for that particular measure, bootstrap won't help unless you will have some way to correct for that. And there are many other statistics that behave in that way. Okay, uh, so we're done with these four, um, and we'll have a couple of quick comments about p-values, effect sizes, and then we'll have a break. Um, so things to remember about p-values. Uh, so first of all, never compare effects by comparing to p-values. So you might have a p-value which is I don't know, uh, 02 and, and 06, uh, and you might be tempted to say, oh, so this effect is stronger. But this is incorrect because uh, you didn't test for that. Maybe the next time you will run this experiment, uh, you will have the opposite. Um, result in terms of p-values. So if you want to um, test the difference between two conditions, you always have to run uh, a direct test comparing them. Um, and this is uh, actually um, a more severe, it's more severe in neuroimaging because of the multiple comparisons problem that we'll see in the next hour. Um, and the second misinterpretation um, sometimes people look at uh, large p-values, like almost one. Okay, so that's, that means that we have no effect. Um, but it doesn't mean that, because under the uh, null hypothesis, p-values, they don't go to one. They are uniformly distributed between zero and one. Um, so you can't learn much from a large p-value. Uh, other than, than that, um, you don't have a significant result. That you don't have evidence against the null hypothesis. Um, and, and I think it's 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 very tempting to to do this misinterpretation uh, when you actually uh, run statistical tests. Um, and I think that both of these misinterpretations are related to the distinction between. Uh, this uh, probability of the data given hypothesis, which is the way the frequency statistic statistics um, ask, question, qu ask questions, uh, and the probability of the hypothesis given the data, which is the Bayesian way. And all the uh, things that we've discussed until now uh, belong to the frequency statistics. Um, so all the p-values we got describe this. We never had uh, this kind of measure, which is much easier to interpret, right? We'd like to know what's the probability that there's no effect, that there's some effect. Um, and the, the, the reason that these are two different parties or, I don't know, religious cults sometimes in statistics is that in order to move uh, from uh, this likelihood to the posterior, uh, you have to incorporate a prior over the hypothesis. You have to have a number, which means how probable is that um, that we don't have an effect, that we have an effect of certain size. 
uh, and for the frequency statistician, statisticians, this is uh, completely illogical step. Uh, and for the Bayesian statistics, uh, this is illogical. Uh, so th these are two different uh, communities. Uh, and currently in science, I think that uh, the frequency is still uh, controlled, but we might see um, a shift, maybe. Personally, for me, when I tried using Bayesian statistics, I kept uh, uh, looking at this uh, prior and, and asking myself, how do I set this prior? Why? Um, so this is why I, I went back to the frequency statistics. Okay, so we won't talk about Bayesian statistics uh, anymore today. Uh, last comment about text sizes. So uh, as we've seen, uh, the uh, t-statistics uh, grows when you add more subjects, given the same size of effect. Uh, and usually we'd like also to measure um, how strong is, this, is the effect, not in terms of uh, standard error or sampling viability, but in terms of the population, right? In terms of the standard deviation of the men and uh, women uh, on Earth in our, our population. Uh, so for that we have effect sizes. Um, the unstandardized effect sizes given in physical units, uh, for example, men are, are uh, seven centimeters higher than uh, women. That would be an unstandardized effect size. In fMRI, you always you don't you don't have that. Uh, maybe in a quantitative uh, MRI, um, like the um, methods that uh, Viv talked about, uh, you might uh, since you measure physical units you might uh, also report these effect sizes. And, and what we usually use in uh, neuroimaging is uh, standardized effect size. So you can um, uh, express your effect in presenting a change. This is very common in uh, fMRI. Uh, or normalize your effect by the standard deviation of the population. Uh, and for the case of two independent normal distributions, the case uh, dealt by the uh, independent t-test, um, the coins D effect size measure is actually, um, again, I'm missing the square root, I'm sorry, um, is actually the um, uh, T statistic without this uh, term uh, that um, shrink the standard error as you add more and more uh, subjects. So when you add more subjects, your coins D, your effect size, uh, will uh, stabilize on the real effect size and won't uh, ex explode like the t-statistic. So it has a very different meaning and uh, many uh, statisticians and, and scientists uh, advocate for reporting effect sizes uh, and not only uh, your test statistics and p-values. Uh, in psychology you can see that more and more in neuroscience Mostly not, I think. Um, but it, it, uh, it's a thing to consider. Um, one point which is easily overlooked is that um, if you have noisy measurements, your effect size will be smaller. For example, if when you measure the height, you add some random uh, amount of uh, centimeters, you will have higher viability in that than the actual viability of your population. So your your will, your uh, effect size will be shrunk. Uh, it doesn't mean that if your measurement will be perfect, you will have infinite effect size. It will just reflect the between subjects variability. Um, okay. And if any of this um, either uh, seems difficult or you want to learn more, uh, this is a, a good book about the basics. Uh, David Hoyle. Um, you have both good examples and uh, mathematical explanations. Um, Kendrick K uh, has um, a good set of videos. I used the first one for this uh, uh, first part of the class. And there's course validated, which is like Stack Overflow for statisticians, uh, in which you can ask questions um, and, and, and get answers. Um, th th it's a bit difficult because these are expert statisticians, so they have a particular way of uh, formulating the questions, uh, but but I, I find it useful. Okay, so let's, let's take a break. Let's see you ten minutes.
אם אין אפקט, על פי זה הסיכוי לראות דייטה קיצוני, נגיד פי קיצוני, כמו שקיבלת, בהינתן השעות האלה. ומה שקורה זה ש... זה אומר שזה לא מובהק. זה אומר שזה לא מובהק. אבל אם את תסמלצי, עכשיו תקחי במסה, תעשי סימולציה, ותסמלצי מצב כזה שיש לך שני סמפלים, בלי הבדל ביניהם. ותסתכלי על ה-T values וה-P values. ה-P values התפלגו יוניפורמית, בצורה אחידה. אם תריצי את הניסוי הזה שוב ושוב. תקבלי התפלגות של P values. סליחה? לא, אם נתונים חדשים, נגיד את הכובע מסנתז את הסנתר החדש, אם באותם נתונים ילך לנקודה אחת. פי ואליו נמוך. פי ואליו נמוך ההתפלגות של הדירה היא ככה. כאילו, זה התאבות, סליחה? זה פי ואליו, וזה הסיכוי לראות פי ואליו כזה, מעבר לניסויים. אבל זה נכון, זה נכון, אם קיבלת פי ואליו מאוד נמוך, זה לא אומר שבוודאות האפקט מובהק. הלוגיקה היא שזה בלתי סביר, כן? לא, פה, תראי, נגיד ההסתברות לקבל משהו קצת נמוך מ-0.5 היא 0.05. תחת ההסתגות האחידה. זה בדיוק מה שזה אומר. לא יצטרף, היא גבוהה גבוה יותר, לא יצטרף, יכול ללכת לאחד, כן? כאילו לאינטרוול מסוים. ככל שהאפקט יותר גדול, אז כאילו זה ילך ויראה יותר ויותר בצורה כזאת. מה? בסדר? זה לוגיקה שהיא ככה, כי זה ככה, כאילו, באיזשהו מקום, זאת אומרת, קיבלתי פיו על נורא קטן, אז זה בלתי סביר. אבל אם יש עוד מאה מדענים כמוך שיעשו אותו דבר, אז חמישה אחוז מתוכם יקבלו גם פיו על קטן במקרה, כן? תחת עולם. אז יש לגישה הזאת מגבלות. במבחן דוח נגיד אתה מספק עם שני הצדדים, ואז כאילו האחד של כיוון אחד והאפס של הכיוון השני. זה הדוח נגיד, במבחן אחד דוח נגיד אתה מספק רק כיוון אחד, ואז הצד של האחד אם אין לו משמעות. את יכולה לשאול האם יש הבדל, האם גברים גבוהים מנשים, זה נכון חד זנבי, או האם יש איזשהו הבדל. והסטטיסטים האלה מתנהגים אחרת. לדו כיווני, אז שני הכיוונים ייתנו לך, אם תסתכלי על הפי ואליו לכיוון אחד, כשהשערה הפוכה נכונה, תקבלי אחד. זה הפוך. מופחים. כאן חד זנבי, אז זה לא מתנהג ככה, זה אין משמעות לאחד. אז יש מקרה מיוחד שבהם את יכולה, שהאחדים הם בעצם משקפים את האפקט האחר. אבל... מה שאמרת עכשיו על הנמוך, 
פי מאוד מאוד גבוה שמתקרב לאחד, הוא בעצם משקף את האפקט ההופכי. כן? אז בכזה מצב, אם אתה חטא שער את האפס, זו ההתפלגות של הפי. זו ההתפלגות של הפי. ואת תצפי שכל פעם שתריץ את הניצוי, פעם תקבלי את השלוש, פעם תקבלי את השש, פעם תקבלי את הפעם, תקבלי את... כן? אז להשוות, לקבל נגיד נקודה שלוש ונקודה שבע ולהגיד נקודה שבע זה אפקט יותר למובהק מהנקודה שלוש זה לא כחובה. זה אומר שאין לך עדות. שלא קיבלת עדות. כי אילו לא היה הבדל, הייתה התפלגות יוניפורם. ולכן אני יכול... אני יודע את זה אנליטית, אני יודע איך זה עובד. אני יודע מראש, אם בניתי את המבחן בצורה נכונה, שאם אני אריץ אותו בעולם שבו השארת האפס היא נכונה, הפי ואליוס הם יתפלגו מנפס לאחד, הם לא יכולים לאחד. לא יקד לך. קודם כל, קודם כל, גם בעולם של שעת רצף נכונה את יכולה לקבל פי ואלי נמוך, נכון? אפשר. מה שמדבר לך זה הסיכוי. את מדבר לך, הפי ואלי זה הסיכוי לקבל כזאת הוצאה. זה מה שזה אומר. אז מה שאני רוצה להגיד, שכשאני מגדיל את האפקט, אז ה-P values הולכים יותר ויותר לאפקט, ההתפלגות שלהם נהיית סביב האפקט, מה שציירתי קודם לכן, כן? בעולם שבו יש אפקט, ההתפלגות היא יותר ויותר סביב האפקט, אבל בעולם שאין אפקט, ההתפלגות לא הולכת לאחת. זו הבעיה. ולכן האחת הוא לא מספר לי משהו שונה מאיפה אבל לא יותר מאשר 0.7. זה העניין. שהאחד זה 0.7, ההסתברות לקבל אותם שווה. אבל זה... שנייה, אבל על זה אני מדבר. שהגודל של ה-P value, כשהוא לא מובהק, הוא לא אינפורמטיבי. זה מה שאני רוצה להגיד. שאין תמיכה בהשארת האפס. אז את רוצה לתרגם יותר סיכוי של השארת האפס נכונה? זה... זה זה. את רוצה את זה. סיכוי של השארת האפס נכונה זה זה. 
כן? מה הסיכוי ששאלת את התיכונה והיא נותנת את האיתה? כל מה שהראיתי לך עד עכשיו, כל מה שעשינו בשעה הקודמת, אין את המוזג הזה. כי הסתכלנו על ההסתברות של הדייטה והיא נותנת לשאלת האיתה. זה לא הפוך. כדי לחשב את ההפוך. היית רוצה... הנקודה שניסיתי להעביר זה שהסיכוי לקבל את השבע ולקבל אחד, לפחות במבחן חד נביא, הסיכוי הוא זהה את החדשות. ולכן הגודל הלא מובהק הוא לא אינפורמטיבי, זה מה שאני יכול לומר. האפס שהוא כן אינפורמטיבי כי את יודעת שבעולם של השערה אלטרנטיבית אז עשיתי ועל הזמנותים בתנועה קטנית. זה לא, זה אומר שאין עדות, זה, זה הדרך המדויקת. אז כדי להגיד יש יותר סיכוי בצורה פורמלית, את צריכה להוסיף את הפריור. כדי להגיד את הסיכוי הזה. כי את לא מדיאלת, לא מדיאלת את השעת היחס כמורה הסתברותית. אתה רק אמרת, בוא נניח השעת היחס נכונה, מה יקרה? אין לך בכלל מודל של השעה האלטרנטיבית. כן, אבל זה לא חלק מהמבחן. בגלל זה המבחן פועל. אבל המבחן לא משתמש, הוא לא משווה בין השתי השערות. פיזיקה בעיקר מזדמנת, זה קיים. אפשר לעשות מודל של השער אלטרנטיבי. זה דבר שהוא בעצמו, הוא קשה, כי צריך להגיד להחליט מה גודל האפקט, כן? כאילו, התוצאות שלך תלויות בהשערות שלך, בקדם השערות על ה... כמה סיגרת מתקפת על זה קשה ויש על זה כאילו, יש על זה מלחמה כאילו על הלוגיקה הזאת. יש קבוצה גדולה של אנשים שאומרים פי ואלי תשתיות. אנחנו צריכים לחשב מדדים ויציאני. זהו, השאלה אם אתה רוצה להניח את הפריור. כן, תודה. מהאלף, מה שראיתי פה. חוץ מכאן דרכי. לא, כאילו, אבל אם... זה משהו שאתה רוצה לדבר. יש למות. דברים שכאילו... תודה. לא, אני לא חובק, לא למה. משהו קצת לבוז זה אני יודע. היא עשירה, וגם אני אוהב לעשות כמה תמונות כדי לראות כאילו פנטק. אוקיי. כאילו, אני מאוד אוהב את הסימולציות. איך זה מתנהג? לעשות פרי מודל. כן. לעשות פרי מודל של הבעיה. Functional MRI. So I'll get back to the stop uh, to the moment in which uh, Leon stopped in his uh, class. Um, so we have we scan subjects uh, and we have time courses of uh, uh, bold signal. And using a GLM, we estimate uh, the contributions of different manipulations, different experimental conditions to these time courses. Um, the results are conveyed uh, as parameter estimates, beta values. Uh, and we have these beta values for each voxel. So together, they form a statistical map, SPM. Um, so for each subject, In each uh, condition, we have a statistical map. And we could stop here uh, and trans uh, translate uh, the individual statistical map into p-values. 
Um, but there are two reasons why we, want, uh, we, we, we don't like to do that. Uh, first, we'd like to generalize about the population. We'd like to somehow say something about the average brain, the average participant. Uh, we don't want to have a condition in which uh, our finding is re relevant only to a single participant. Um, and the second reason that we would like to have uh, some uh, group analysis is that uh, the statistical inference uh, in the first level is quite complex because the time points are dependent, they are autocorrelated. So we have to have a good model of this autocorrelation in order to uh, uh, compute uh, correct p-values for uh, our effects at the first level um, analysis. And once we move to testing um, effects across subjects, the subjects by definition are uh, independent of each other, unless they somehow uh, transfer information um, before the experiment. Uh, but the subjects are usually independent, and now the classical statistics uh, work much better. Um, but uh, I have to say that uh, recently there, there are many efforts of still uh, having good, uh, good model of the first level analysis using uh, good models of the autocorrelation of the ball signal. So we can still use the information uh, from the individual time points when we make uh, group uh, inference. That's uh, called in fMRI mixed effects. Um, this. <coughs> No, not usually not the p-values. Usually these would be uh, beta values. Okay, these would be beta values or differences between beta values. So we might uh, show faces and houses to the subject. We'll have one uh, beta value for faces, one for houses, and the difference would be met uh, for each voxel and each subject. Okay, this is called contrast of parameter estimate. So we now we will consider one beta or one linear combination of beta values. A linear combination would be faces minus houses, for example. For, for this subject, we have a, a beta for houses and beta for faces, right? Yes. And so we can form a statistical map for the response for faces. And if we are interested in the difference, we might form a statistical map for the response for faces minus the response for hash for that subject for each box. Okay? Please. I'm not sure I understand what is autocorrelation. So if you look at the um, ball signal, each sample is quite similar to the next one. Uh, and this is caused uh, both uh, by uh, measurement noise by movement of the subject, uh, by um, actual correlations between neural activity in different time points. Um, so we don't, we, we can't treat each volume of the fMRI scan as an independent uh, observation. So usually when you do statistics in uh, GLM settings, in uh, regression, the usual examples are that each observation is a person. Right, you will calculate the relationship between eating uh, carrots, uh, eating uh, cabbages, and cancer. Right, but here we, we use regression, but we don't have this uh, independency. So this is why we have either to uh, use only the second level analysis for inference, or uh, incorporate a good model of the autocorrelation. Okay, so. Once we uh, combine these uh, beta values, uh, for example, by uh, running a t-test uh, on all the beta values, so uh, we might have uh, beta values for faces, so one sample t-test uh, versus zero, we test whether uh, these beta values are different than zero, significantly across subjects, uh, or we can compare between two groups, whether the responses to faces are different in 
democratic or Republican voters, that's quite uh, popular, um, or we can uh, compare to different conditions within uh, each subject, uh, either by running a paired t-test between one row of beta values for, for example, faces and one, one column of uh, beta values for faces and one column for uh, houses, or just run a one sample t-test for the differences between the two, which is equivalent. So in, in, all cases, in all of these cases, we translate these beta values into a single statistical map, which is common to all of the subjects. Uh, for that, uh, we need also to bring the subjects to the same space, uh, um, something that we want to discuss today. Um, and, and the result is a map of p-values. And in usual volume of fMRI, standard resolution will have about 60,000 uh, voxels, voxels. So we have many statistical tests that are done in parallel. And this leads us to the multiple comparison problem. Uh, so We can, but we need to have a good model. So after we get, like, imply this model, then we run the t-test? So if you do, if you have a good model, you can run the first level analysis and you can translate these uh, beta estimates to p-values directly. You can run also a mixed effect analysis which looks both of, of, at the vi uh, viability at the between subjects level and the vi viability in time. That's the mixed effect analysis. And the random effect analysis, which is the simplest solution, uh, would uh, just use the beta values. We throw all the information about the time points. We look at the beta values that summarize uh, the time courses to, to, to a single point in each voxel and each subject. And now we, we run t-tests on that. This is uh, from a book by uh, Westphal and Young, which is about uh, the mutation-based corrections to uh, the multiple comparison problem. And they have this entertaining uh, list of rules. Uh, so with enough testing, false positives will occur. Um, and 60,000 voxels is enough. Uh, internal evidence will not contradict the false positive result. So you have a false positive, and this is how the data looks like. It, it's quite difficult to, to um, disqualify this false positive uh, once you have it. Uh, good investigators will come up with a possible explanation. So scientists uh, generate explanations. So you can give them a pattern, and they will give a good explanation why this has happened. Um, and this makes uh, the MCP really dangerous, right? Because anything goes, right? You get some result and you will find a story. And it only happens to the other person. Um, which is highly related to the formal point, right? Because you, can, you don't see your own uh, false explanations. And um, this is the data summary that you already see. And what it did is to run uh, uncorrected statistical tests and simply use uh, 
this cutoff of uh, one over a thousand uh, for the critical p-value, um, and they found that this fish is uh, responding significantly to sad or happy movies, uh, the dead uh, salmon fish. And the point made by this poster, which have, uh, it has um, 100 citations, uh, is that it's not enough to show that you have really small p-values. You need to do something formal about uh, the probability that you will uh, see a false discovery. So there are two ways to um, define uh, this probability. One is the family-wise error. Uh, and the uh, other is false discovery, discovery rate, uh, and we'll talk about both. Uh, for the family-wise error, um, the definition is the probability of making at least one false alarm or discovery, it's the same thing, for n independent tests. So, sorry, this is the definition, the probability of making at least one false alarm. And for n independent tests, uh, we have uh, an analytical uh, solution for that, and you can see that uh, the probability of making at least one uh, type one mistake, at least one, one uh, false discovery, uh, approaches one very quickly. Uh, so for a neuroimaging experiment with thousands of voxels or channels, um, you will certainly, if you want correct, you will certainly have significant p-value under the null. So the easiest thing uh, to do as uh, an analyst is to uh, apply the Bonferroni correction, which means uh, divide your critical values by the number of um, uh, tests, or in our case, the number of voxels. Um, for independent samples, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a good correction, it's quite tight. Uh, for uh, positively dependent samples, uh, this is a highly conservative test. For example, think about the uh, situation in which you take one voxel, and you duplicate it. So you have the same responses in the duplicated voxels. Um, now, you didn't increase your uh, probability of making uh, a type 1 error, because if uh, a type 1 error will happen in the, first in the original voxels, it will also happen in the duplicated and vice versa. Um, but for Bonferroni, you now increase your n by 1. So Bonferroni is uh, doesn't have access to the smoothness uh, of your data in space. Uh, and since fMRI data, and as we will see later also EEG data, they're quite smooth, um, using Gonzoni uh, is very inefficient. The more... Uh, so, I think that the duplicated voxel is uh, an, ex an extreme case, right? You du duplicate a channel and you see whether... So if you observe the uh, response in one voxel and its neighbor, they will be quite similar. That's a... Okay? So to the dependency of the data. It just assumes uh, independency. So if you have a, a strong positive dependency in your data, uh, this would be highly conservative. You, your p-values would be um, larger than what you could get. Okay, so there are also uh, more powerful um, family-wise error corrections like uh, the SIDAC and Home and so on. Um, but there's one correction which is um, especially useful because it can estimate the uh, smoothness of the data. So this is the max p, min p, family-wise error control. And this is a random permutation test. And the idea is that uh, in each simulation, you randomly permute your experimental conditions. It might be in trials if you're interested in first-level analysis, or subjects if it's a second-level analysis. Um, so you form the random permutation. And now you form a new statistical parametric map. Okay, so for each voxel you have, for example, a t-value for that permutation. You look at that new map that you synthesized, and you take only the largest t-value. Okay, the max t. What do you do? What is 
So uh, le le let's say that we compare between uh, men and women. Okay, let's just stay with this uh, example. So you, you permit between men and women, and now you compare, for example, the fMRI of men and women. Um, so for each permutation, you have a map of digit cells, a map in space. For each, for each voxel and each permutation, you will have uh, a T statistic. And if you consider one simulation, one permutation, you can look at the maximal T statistic and write it down, write it down. Put it in your null distribution. And you do that many, many times uh, until you um, generate an empirical null distribution of the largest uh, T value that you can observe under the null. No, no, no. We are now considering a mass massively, massive universe approach. Each voxel is a separate kingdom, right? So you have a T value in that voxel between the activity in that voxel in one condition and the activity in that voxel in another condition. We don't have here any comparisons between voxels. But you do po uh, pull cross voxels when you pick the max T. Okay? So for a given simulation, you look at, at your simulated brain and you pick the strongest, the highest T value and write it down. Um, so then you look at this uh, empirical null distribution, which is now a null distribution of the maximum uh, effect that you, uh, the ma maximum test statistic that you expect to see, uh, and you compare each T value, not only the maximal one, each T value of the original map to this distribution of the max T in the same way that we've seen before with that uh, b plus 1 divided by n plus 1. And now you get um, this uh, generates p-values which are family-wise error-corrected um, because you consider the worst case. <coughs> um, and, and this is uh, very useful because let's go back to the example of duplicating a voxel. So now if you will duplicate a voxel, this test won't be more conservative because the duplicated voxel will have the same uh, behavior as the original one and it won't uh, affect the distribution of the max t. But if you will add another independent channel with a new source of noise, now the max t will be bigger. Right? If you have more and more channels, the maximum over these channels uh, uh, grows. Yes, you still pay a price for introducing more and more channels, but this test uh, accounts for the uh, correlations, for the dependence across uh, different voxels. Yeah, but doesn't this increase the, the, the correlation? So it's less powerful than not correcting, the, right? If you won't correct your p-values, you will, it will be more powerful, but your test won't be valid. We want to have a valid test um, and ha yet have the maximum power we can, we, we can have. Any, any questions on that? To make sure I understand, mm -hmm. the T value the largest absolute. It depends. You can do it if, if you have a two tailed question. Okay. Yeah. So you'll, you can take the absolute, or you can run once a one tailed T test for one direction and do this uh, analysis and then do it for the other direction and multiply your p-values by two. If you, let's assume that they have a uh, particular p-value. Um, so I, I can, one way would be to record the absolute values and have a distribution of the absolute values. So now it won't be centered around Zero, it would be like okay. Actually, al also in the other case, it won't be centered around zero because we are looking at the max. So this is uh, abst. 
and then when you take your empirical t, whether it's 7 or minus 7, you will uh, look uh, how extreme is it related to this distribution. And you can always also uh, run two um, one-tailed tests. So look at the um, maximal t, not absolute value, and then your minus 7 won't be significant, but it will be significant in the other, the other test. Yes. Yes. It's a max minus p. I would say max minus p. If you separate the, your test to two uh, one-tailed tests, you make sure that your um, test size, that your alpha, is actually two and a half and not something else. Because if you do the absolute t, it might be divided like four and one, or depending on your data. So that's the max t, and it is also called the min p because instead of looking at the values, we can look at the uncorrected p-values and pick the smallest p-value and do uh, tests on these uh, p-values. Uh, and as the random permutation test, this is a very flexible um, a approach. You can uh, apply it on any kind of uh, statistic. And um, we'll do that in the exercise uh, for people who take the lab. Um, and one question about uh, family wide error is um, what is the family? How many tests are, uh, if you correct for multiple testing, do you have to correct for one contest? Do you have to correct for all of the contests that you tested in, in your study? Maybe you want to make sure that uh, the probability of having any mistake, uh, type one mistake in your study, uh, is no more than um, zero 0.5. Um, usually in, in, in neuroimaging, <coughs> we would correct only for a single map. Uh, the patients usually will say that you need to uh, think more broadly about, about your experiment and correct for all the stuff that you tried. Uh, okay, so this is one approach, fairly wider, and now we'll talk about uh, false discovery rate, which is a different way to measure uh, false uh, type 1 uh, errors. Uh, so now we have this proportion, which is uh, the proportion of false discoveries among all discoveries, false plus true. Um, and this has, uh, this has a different meaning, right? Because you can control your FDR, it will be uh, 0.5, and now you have 1,000 uh, significant voxels, and by controlling the FDR, you don't say that there's a probability of uh, less than a 0 0.5 uh, that you will have a false alarm. You say that out of these 1,000 uh, significant voxels, uh, only 5% only five percent, uh, are false positive. Um, so you are uh, willing to tolerate, tolerate uh, some type 1 errors, uh, but you demand that most of your significant effects will be true. Uh, and, and to be more exact, you, you demand that the expectancy of this proportion would be uh, controlled. Um, and a nice feature of that is, is uh, that if you have the um, global uh, null distribution that there's no effect whatsoever, um, the family-wide error control also controls for the um, so the FDR also controls for the FWE the family-wide error. So uh, you can uh, you can use it safely um, if you want to to ask whether you have any effect. I, I, I see some faces. Uh,
I, I will show how we do it. I didn't show how we do it. This is just the definition of what we want to control. Okay, this is instead of controlling the family wise array. The expectancy of the, the true positive is 95%. Yes. Right. But you can't Right. So, so we pay a price in the, the specificity of our infer inference. Um, and this is just the definition, and there are many different procedures to enforce a particular queue. Um, also, sampling based approaches, which are not yet pop popular. Uh, this is the um, finish term. Uh, this is the Bonferroni um, uh, Hochberg procedure, which means that you sort uh, the p values uh, from the smallest one to the largest one. Uh, and now you compare the first value to <coughs> your uh, critical uh, alpha uh, divided by number of channels. So here it would be um, the I think that they used a uh, p-value of uh, uh, dot one for the general alpha, so it is divided by 10. And then you compare the second p-value to uh, two, time, 2 divided by 10 times alpha, and so on. Uh, you can look at this graphically. So uh, if this is the rank of the p-values, and this is the p-value, so you generate a line with a slope um, of a alpha, and you look uh, at which uh, p-values reside below this line. And the first p-value, uh, sorry, the largest p-value, which is below this line, uh, is declared, and, and then we reject with and declare significant all of the p-values to its left, regardless of whether they are above or below the line. And if we we'll go back to the table, so the fifth p-value here um, is below um, uh, this quantity, so we uh, declare all of the p-values smaller, uh, smaller than that um, as significant. Uh, including this one, which is greater than the uh, line at that point. So that's the bonsoni hopper procedure, uh, and it controls uh, FDR under, uh, under uh, independency, and they also show that in most cases it controls FDR in, uh, FDR in positive dependency. Um, Can you say how you got the values on the right side? So for the smallest p-value, it's uh, alpha divided by the number of um, uh, tests, of voxels, okay? So if you have 1,000 voxels, it will be uh, alpha divided by 1,000. Alpha would be, is your um, um, proportion, in this case, it will be the proportion of uh, a false uh, true positive among uh, positive that you want to control for. That's the other two. If you want to have, sorry? No. If you want to have 95% uh, true uh, discoveries among the discoveries, the alpha would be 5%. So you compare the uh, first, uh, the, the smallest p-value to alpha divided by the number of, of voxels. And then the second p-value is compared to uh, alpha divided the number of voxels times two, and then times three, and so on. So you generate this line. And the first, uh, the, the largest p-value uh, below this line uh, makes all of the smaller p-values significant, according to the FDR criterion. 
And obviously, this is much more powerful. You get much more um, blobs for your buck. Um, but it has implications, as Leon say, nothing is guaranteed about particular voxels uh, or channels, only in, in average. Uh, we will finish this slide. Um, and if you have an effect which is very spread, affecting many voxels, it will be easier to see uh, than an effect which is highly localized, because the uh, small p-values will have help the larger uh, p-values to pass the criterion. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, if we'll uh, take away the depression, um, this p-value won't be significant because we will compare it uh, to a more strict uh, criterion. Um, okay, we'll, we'll stop here. Thank you.